Welcome to the preaching and teaching ministry of Second Baptist Church, where we exist to delight in God, display His grace, and declare His gospel all through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can be reached at www.2bcmtv.org or by calling 618-244-1706. We trust you'll be encouraged and challenged by the message you're about to hear. Well, it is a joy to be back with you this week. I want to extend a special thank you to your church for allowing the elders to be gone last weekend. Uh, we had a wonderful time being together and being equipped to better serve you, being encouraged. So thank you so much for allowing us to be gone last week. Uh, thank you, Joey, for your faithful preaching of the word, brother. You served us well. So thank you. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. Lord, we thank you for the Bible that is the very God-breathed words that you have moved human authors by your Holy Spirit to pen this book. And now we ask that that same Holy Spirit who inspired these words would illumine your word and give us understanding. Would you write the truths on our hearts in a way that we are shaped and transformed by them? Help us to see your glory today as we behold it in your word, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to take it and open to the letter of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This morning, we begin here what will be a two-part Many series on the topic of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Now, just in case you're new with us, this is not our normal pattern. It's not our normal pattern to preach like this. Mostly we preach uh, as a church through entire books or through entire sections of Scripture. Uh, we've just finished a month long series on the Sermon on the Mount. Here in a couple of weeks, we're going to begin a brand new series walking through the book of Hebrews together. So we're sort of in between sermon series right now. So this is not our normal pattern to preach topically like this. And yet, there are times in the life of a church where it is important to address certain important topics, certain current issues, certain doctrines. And that's what we want to do this week and next week as we look at this topic of the Lord's Supper. Now, Why the Lord's Supper? Why would we want to focus in specifically on this particular topic? Let me give you just a few reasons why. Uh, Number one, first of all, I'm ashamed to say that in my six plus years here in serving at this church, I've never actually specifically preached on the topic of the Lord's Supper, which is, we'll talk about only one of two institutions that Jesus, ordinances that Jesus actually commanded his church to observe. So it's a very important topic in the life of a church that needs to be addressed. A second reason, also secondly, is that there is no small amount of confusion surrounding this topic of the Lord's Supper, is there? Especially depending on your church background, the church tradition that you come from, But there is a lot of confusion over this topic of the Lord's Supper. And sadly, as Baptists, we we historically have spent so much time explaining what the Lord's Supper is not that we wonder, is there any meaning to it at all? But there's a lot of confusion surrounding this topic. Questions like, what is it? Does it actually become the body and the blood of Jesus? Or what does it mean? Why, why is it significant? What is, what's its purpose? Who is, it, who is allowed to take it? Is it just for a certain group of people? Is it for everybody? When should we take it? Where should we take it? How often should we take it? When I came to this church 
I think we were observing maybe a quarterly observance of the Lord's Supper. We've moved that to a, a, a monthly observance of the Lord's Supper. There would be some who would champion a weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. How often should we take it? Does the Bible have anything to say about that? So there's all of these questions surrounding the meaning, the mode of this ordinance. And then, of course, you add on top of that all of, all of what has happened over the course of history where the Lord's Supper has been abused, it has been distorted. And so I think it would be very helpful, church, for us to seek some clarity on this matter. What does the Bible actually say? And not only that, what should be our practice as a church? Is, is that what we do? Do we practice what the Bible actually teaches? In fact, I found that in my years of ministry, there is a significant lack of teaching on the topic of the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and therefore, there's a considerable lack of clarity on these issues as well, and so I think we would do well to seek to try and understand, okay, what does the Scripture actually teach? But here's the other reason. The other reason I think this topic matters and should be important to us, and really it's the most important of all, it's because of what the Lord's Supper points to. What the Lord's Supper points to. The great church father, Augustine, he said it like this, quote, the ordinances or the sacraments of the church, baptism, Lord's Supper, the ordinances of the church are an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. They are an outward visible sign of an inward spiritual grace, he says. And so... The Lord's Supper is a sign. It's a, it's a visible display that points to a reality that is different from and more significant than itself. Now that's a very important sentence, so let me say it again. The Lord's Supper is a sign. It is a visible display that points to a reality that is different from and yet far greater than itself. So, for example, you drive just a few miles outside of the city, and you're going to see a sign that points the way to Chicago. And you can be very familiar with that sign. You can, you can have grown up seeing that sign. You can see it every day on your way to work. You can know the sign and yet never have actually been to Chicago. Never have actually experienced the reality that it's pointing to. Right? Right? Or you can see a billboard for a restaurant, a new restaurant in town, and you can be familiar with that billboard. You can, in fact, you can have the menu of that restaurant memorized, and what? You've never actually eaten at the restaurant, and you've missed what the sign was intended to point to. And the same is true when it comes to the topic of the Lord's Supper. There is a danger in being so familiar with the sign without ever embracing the reality to which the sign points. You can participate in the outward sign, the outward display, without knowing, without experiencing the inward reality to which it points. And therefore, I think it's very important that as individuals and as a church, we pay careful attention to this matter of the Lord's Supper. What is it meant to point to? And we find the answer right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's what Paul is addressing here. So let's read our text, and then I'll tell you where we're going this week and next. If you have your place there, would you stand with me as we honor together the reading of God's Word, beginning in verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place... When you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal, one goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? <laughs> 
Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. As I said a moment ago, there are two and only two ordinances of the church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism, and by that I mean, we mean believer's baptism. That you have been baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ. Baptism is your initiation into the membership of the local church, testifying publicly to your faith in Jesus. That's what baptism is. It's, it's a public declaration testifying your faith in Jesus. To say, I, I'm, I'm testifying, I, I'm following Jesus. I'm, I'm putting on the, the team jersey. I'm putting on the Jesus jersey. I'm identifying with Jesus and his people. That's what baptism is. And the second then is the Lord's Supper, which is your ongoing participation and fellowship with the local church. It's, it's the family meal. It's, it's marking out and marking off who is and who is not a part of the family. Who's not on the team. Who's not part of the church and who is. And again, there are only two ordinances of the church. A number of you will come out of a church background where it was taught that there are seven ordinances or seven sacraments of the church if you grew up Roman Catholic. And if that's you, I would just say to you, and you're struggling here, I would say to you to take all seven of those sacraments and then take your Bible and I want you to look for all seven of those sacraments And you keep all the ones you find and you discard all the ones you don't find. And here's what you're going to find at the end of that exercise. There are only two. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Only two given by Jesus, only two underscored in the New Testament. That's why they're called ordinances. They are ordained, they are instituted, they are commanded by Jesus Christ himself. For example, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, just after Jesus ascends back to be with the Father after his resurrection from the dead, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Instituted, commanded by Jesus himself, baptism. Or in Luke chapter 22, just before his death, we'll look here in a moment, Jesus, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you, do this, do this in remembrance of me. It is commanded, it is instituted by Christ himself. So these are the only two ordinances of the church. And let me emphasize 
These are ordinances given to the church. Not to be individually practiced and observed however and whenever you want to. But within the context of the gathered local church. In fact, just one more historical note here. If you were to ask, what, what is essential to having a local church? Like, what, what makes a church a church? Well, Protestants have historically answered that question in terms of three essential components. There's three things. Number one, believers gathered. You gotta have believers gathered. Number two, the right preaching of the gospel. The true preaching of the biblical gospel. And number three, the right observance of the ordinances. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Yes, there are more when it comes to what it takes to build a healthy church, but at a bare minimum, three. Those three must be present. Believers gathered, if you don't have that, you don't have a church. The right preaching of the gospel, if you don't have that, you don't have a church. If you're not rightly observing the ordinances, you don't have a church. This is what marks off the visible church and protects the gospel. So if godly men and women have read their Bibles and seen the Lord's Supper as such a central role in the church, then it would be wise for us to make sure we get it right. But even more than that, to not miss out on something that is so incredibly significant. And so this week, I want to answer the questions of the origin and the purpose of the Lord's Supper. How did it begin? What's the origin? And why is it significant? And then next week, we're going to spend more time talking about who can participate. Who can participate and how should we participate? And we'll also next week try to answer some common questions as well. So this week, I want to talk about the origin and the purpose. Now, just a couple more introductory things. I promise I'm about to get to the text, okay? A couple more introductory things. Number one, two things I just want to say. First of all, the Lord's Supper goes by many names. It goes by many names. Throughout church history, there has been known what is called the breaking of bread. Right? You see this in the book of Acts. They, they broke bread together. That's an early lingo for the Lord's Supper. It's also known as the Eucharist, which just comes from the Greek transliteration of the word thanksgiving. It's also called just communion. Symbolizing our union with Jesus Christ and our communion, our union with one another in the context of the body of Christ. And then, of course, it's just called the Lord's Supper. So it's gone by many names, and you can see how each one of those names signifies aspects of this particular meal. Here's the second thing I just want to say. There have been, historically, four different views on the Lord's Supper which, as you can imagine, has caused centuries-old <laughs> divisions and debates about uh, this meal. Now, we don't have time to look at those, okay? Uh, you can come to me later. You can do some study on your own. But here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. All of those various views emerged out of the Reformation because of what Protestants saw as an abuse and distortion by the Roman Catholic Church of the Lord's Supper. Okay? So what did the Roman Catholic Church teach? Well, without getting into the weeds, here's simply what they taught. They taught what is known as transubstantiation. Maybe you've heard that term before. Transubstantiation. Meaning that the Mass, the Lord's Supper as they call it, the Mass, the bread and the cup, actually become the body and blood of Christ. So the, the substance is transformed. Looks like bread, juice, wine, juice. Tastes like it, but it, it actually becomes it. Substance is transformed. 
So what's happening in the Lord's Supper? Well, the Roman Catholic says the elements are transformed into the blood and body of Christ. That's why when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, he means literally. So the bread and the cup then, over time, came to be regarded not as signs of grace, as Augustine said, but containing grace infused, actually, with grace that is necessary for the forgiveness of your sins. Do you see the difference? So, the sign doesn't simply point to Chicago now. The sign is Chicago. The bread and the cup no longer point to the reality. The bread and the cup have become the reality. Do you see the difference? And not only is that a distortion of the Lord's Supper, it is a distortion of the gospel. That it's essential for salvation and the forgiveness of sins. And the reformer said, no, you've confused the sign with the reality. So then what did it point to? Where did it all begin? And what's the significance And with that, we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look there. Because not only was the supper historically distorted by the Roman Catholic Church, but it was even being distorted by the church at Corinth as well. That's what's going on here in this passage. It's being distorted. How is it being distorted? It's being distorted in the manner in which they're taking it. Now, here's what you need to know about the letter of 1 Corinthians. This letter was written in the context of dysfunction and chaos. There is a lot of dysfunction and chaos. I mean, this is, this is one messed up church. I am so grateful in God's grace that he included this letter in the Bible because we can see that there are some messed up churches and there are certain eras that we, errors that we can avoid by following what we see here. But this is a messed up church with a lot of issues and a lot of problems. You don't have to read very far to see this. There are factions. There are divisions. There is rampant immorality and rampant idolatry. This is a church in chaos, especially when they're gathering for corporate worship. And so after confronting many of these issues in chapters 1 through 10, here in chapter 11 now, Paul turns to talk about how they are abusing the Lord's Supper when they gather. Look there, verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. So he's confronting their abuse of the supper, which we see in verse 18 is divisions among them. And he confronts this abuse by explaining then the meaning of it. That that it's, it's meant to be a sign pointing to something. What's it pointing to? Well, if you go down in verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. And so as a result, this meal, it isn't unifying them. It's dividing them. It's meant to unify, not divide. It's meant to unify all those who confess their common need for Christ and His cross, to which the sign was meant to point. And yet, by the way they're taking it, they're distorting that sign. That's the issue going on here. So there's really three movements here in this text in which Paul seeks to correct this abuse. Look look at these three movements. Let me just point them out to you. Section 1, first one, verses 17 to 22, he highlights the error, the problem going on in Corinth, the abuse. And then in section 2, which you see down in verse 23 to 26, he reminds them of the origin and the institution of the supper by Jesus. He reminds them of what Jesus says it means. What he says it points to. And then in section 3, which you see in verses 27 to 34, he instructs them on how they should take it. They need to examine themselves before they take it. Making sure they're taking it in a worthy manner, not an unworthy manner. 
And so this week, I just want to focus in on the first two sections there, verses 17 to 26, and then next week, we'll look at sections 3 and 4, verses 27 to 34, and who can, who can take it and how we should take it. So two headings this morning, just notice with me the origin and the purpose. The origin and the purpose. First, notice the origin. We see the origin down there, notice in verses 23 to 26, where Paul's going to unpack Jesus' institution of it. But before you look at that, just again, let me set the stage what's happening in Corinth. Look at verse 17. Paul is rebuking them. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. This is a rebuke. He is correcting their abuse. In fact, what we're going to see is that when they come together, it isn't for their good, for the better, he says, it's actually making things worse. This is destructive behavior. In fact, look at verse 20. They think they're eating the Lord's Supper when actually they're not. They're not. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you're eating. Oh, you may be taking the bread and you may be drinking the cup, but you're not eating the Lord's Supper. Why? Well, verse 18, because when you come together as a church and you take the Lord's Supper, verse 18, I hear that there are divisions among you. There cannot be divisions among you and you properly take the Lord's Supper. How so? What, what were these divisions? Well, you can go back and read chapters 1, 1 to 4, some of these divisions. But here in chapter 11, the divisions are less theological in nature and more relational. In fact, you could say sociological. What I mean by that is dividing the rich and the poor in the church. In other words, by the way they're taking the supper, some, it seems the poor, are being left out. Perhaps they're even being relegated to a different room than the rest, than the rich. While the rich are indulging and isolating themselves. Look, look there at verses 21 and 22, it explains this. For in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal, one goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? You're, you're filling up here, you're getting drunk, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? That's not what you're supposed to be doing. Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. First, just notice it seems that the early church is taking the Lord's Supper in conjunction with a meal. It, this, this is happening in the context of a meal that they're sharing, right? Eating and drinking a meal. Some are going hungry. Some are getting drunk. Oh my. But second... It seems to be a division between the poor, the, the have-nots, those who are going hungry, those who are humili humiliated because they don't have anything to eat, and the rich, the haves, those who are eating to their full and getting drunk. New Testament scholar Tom Schreiner, he comments, notice what he says, at the meal, each person eats what he or she has brought to the supper, but social divisions are evident, for the poor are hungry and not, do not get enough to eat at the supper while the rich are satiated. Perhaps the rich were eating and drinking in one room, which was the dining room, and the poorer were out in the atrium and not getting sufficient food and drink. Indeed, some of the rich were even getting drunk. I mean, this is chaos. And it is creating divisions. And Paul writes to say, listen, what you're taking is not the Lord's Supper. You may be eating the bread, you may be drinking the cup, but it isn't the Lord's Supper that you're taking. Because by what you're doing, you're distorting the sign intended to point to the reality. 
Your behavior is distorting the gospel because the gospel breaks down all those barriers. And then in verses 23 to 26, he reminds them of the origin. Where did it all begin? Look there, verse 23. Probably very familiar verses to many of you. You hear them often before taking. And Paul reminds them that this meal was instituted by Jesus himself. Look there, verse 23. For, so he's explaining now why what they are doing is distorting the significance of this meal. That for is very important. For, here's why I can't commend you. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. So Paul had received these instructions as an apostle from Christ. And now he's already taught them this. And he's reminding them. Verse 23. I received what I also delivered from you from the Lord. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. So what's the origin? Christ himself verse 23, institutes it on the night before his death. The night before his crucifixion, his betrayal. In fact, go with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 22 for a moment. You can find this recorded in all three synoptic gospels, but I want you to see it in Luke chapter 22, where Jesus institutes this. He's at the table with his disciples. Look there, verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is finished in the kingdom of God. And then in verse 19 and in verse 20, he explains... The broken bread as his body that's given for them. And the cup as the new covenant in his blood. And at the end of verse 19, he says, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. So, the origin of the Lord's Supper is instituted by Jesus on the night before his death. To point to the reality of the cross. But we can actually trace the origins back even further than that. We can actually go back even further than that because Jesus here sets the context of the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, in the context, notice, of the Passover, the Passover meal. Look there again, verse 15. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Eating the Passover when they take the Lord's Supper. So Jesus, he wants us to see the Lord's Supper then in the broader storyline of the Bible, of the Old Testament. In the context here of the Passover meal. Let me just show you this again. It's very clear, Luke shows us. Luke chapter 22, look at verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. Or look at verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Or look at verse 8. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. So Luke, he's setting this all in the context of the Passover. You see that? So if we don't understand, if we don't grasp the Passover and how it's meant to function in Israel, then we're going to miss what the Lord's Supper is doing here. And even more, what it means to be a Christian. So let's just go back even further to the Passover. We read it a moment ago in Exodus chapter 20, 12, excuse me. What was the Passover meal? You can turn there if you want. What was the Passover meal? 
Passover meal was one of the most significant feasts in defining God's covenant people and shaping their identity. And if you recall, God's people were in slavery in Egypt. God had chosen them to rescue them, deliver them, to liberate them from their slave masters. And so God sent nine plagues of judgment. But it isn't until the tenth plague that Israel is finally set free. And the tenth plague was the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. And as part of this final plague, God institutes the Passover. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, we read, Each household is to take an unblemished lamb and sacrifice that lamb. And then in verse 7, they're to take the blood of that lamb and they're to paint it on the doorposts of the house, the home. And when God passed through that night, the land, to kill the firstborn, if he saw the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, then he would pass over that house. And so everyone under the protection of the lamb's blood would not receive the judgment of God because it was the Lamb's blood that made atonement for everybody under it, everybody inside the home. No participation in the Passover, no sparing safety from God's judgment. Participation in the Passover, sparing from the judgment of God. And the very next day, they're set free set apart, brought into covenant with God at Mount Sinai. So you can see how that meal is meant to shape the identity of God's people. In fact, each year it was meant to be observed to remind them, to recall, to remember how God had delivered them from the death by the blood of the Lamb, freed them, made them his own covenant people so that every time they ate it, they were looking back to past deliverance. And then in Luke chapter 22, we come to Jesus eating now the Passover meal with his disciples where he is now, note this, interpreting the elements of the Passover meal in light of his own impending death. Verse 15, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Verse 19, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Verse 20, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do you see what's going on here? Jesus is fulfilling the Passover. He's bringing it all to its intended goal. He's bringing it all to to its intended end. It was all meant to point to him. Why? Because, beloved, we needed a lamb that wouldn't just deliver us from the temporary plague of death. We needed a lamb that could deliver us from the eternal wrath of God. We needed a lamb not just to liberate us from the bondage of our oppressors. We needed a lamb who could free us from the tyranny of sin. We needed a lamb whose blood could actually atone for our sins, under whom we we could hide from the judgment and the wrath of God that is coming for the forgiveness of sins to bring us into a better and new covenant. And that lamb is Jesus Christ. And now... The Passover is fulfilled in Christ, and he has replaced it. He has transformed it now to center it around him. It's about me. It's a new meal with a new meaning. No more lambs are needed. Since the one true lamb who takes away the sin of the world has been sacrificed. And now we experience, as the church, the new covenant community of God 
by his death and resurrection, we experience the ultimate exodus from sin and death. That's what the supper is meant to point to. Right here. That's the origin, to point to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the sinless sacrifice for all, dying in our place, body crushed to bear the wrath of God, blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And that's all right here in the bread and the cup. And that's what the Corinthians were distorting. They were taking a meal that was meant to symbolize their unity as the covenant people of God, together needing the sacrifice of this lamb for their sins. And they weren't living like it. It wasn't being reflected in their life together, which is why in verse 20, Paul says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you're eating. You've missed it. You've missed the point. Which then leads us to the purpose. The purpose of the supper. Why, why do we celebrate it? What's, what's its purpose? Second heading, final heading, the purpose. Why do we eat and drink it today? Well, the easy answer is because Jesus told us to. Right? Do this in remembrance of me. It's just simple obedience to Jesus. But... This is not just some bare command. No, his purpose, church, is to bless us. To bless us. This is a most gracious command. Oh, so what I want to mention here, I want to mention four purposes for the Lord's Supper. And we'll describe them as four looks. Four looks. Now, these are not original to me, but I think they're very helpful. Four directions we're intended to look as we take the Lord's Supper together that reveal its purpose. So this is, this is the application, okay? And then we're going to actually apply it by taking the Lord's Supper together here in a moment. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, we are to take four looks. Here they are. Look number one. Look number one. We look back in remembrance and proclamation. We look back in remembrance and proclamation. First and foremost, the purpose of celebrating the supper is to remember and proclaim God's past deliverance in Christ. His past deliverance. This is probably the most obvious reason we take the Lord's Supper. Look there, verse 24, where Jesus explicitly commands, Paul says, do this in remembrance of me. So what are we to remember? We're to remember something. We're to remember Christ. We remember. And look at verse 26. We are also proclaiming something. What are we proclaiming as we take it? Well, Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the first reason we celebrate it is to remember and to proclaim. What are we remembering? Do this in remembrance of me. We are remembering Christ's once for all sacrifice on our behalf. His blood, his body, these are symbols pointing us back. And we're reminding ourselves, beloved, we need the gospel. Every time you take it, you're saying, I need this. I need the gospel just as much as the lost world out there. I need his body. I need his blood. And we're proclaiming as well. What are we proclaiming? We're proclaiming his death, he says. Every time you eat it, as often as you do it, you proclaim the Lord's death. Each time, each time you eat the bread and drink the cup, it is as if you are getting up here in the pulpit and you are saying, you are declaring to the rest of the church the great things God has done for you. You are broadcasting to the world the finished work of Christ for you. 
breaking the power of sin for you, securing eternal salvation for you. The supper, listen very carefully, the supper doesn't announce what we have done to get ourselves ready for the table. The supper does not announce what we have done to get ourselves ready for the table. No, rather, it announces everything Jesus has done and finished in order to fit you for the table. The righteous died for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. We remember and we proclaim. You know, memory memory has a very powerful effect on us, doesn't it? Think about this. You, You hear a song on the radio and it just like takes you back to the past, right, where you first heard it. Or, or you taste, you know, you taste a certain food maybe your mama used to make, you taste it, and it just transport you, transports you somewhere back in history, right, to a certain time and location. Isn't it incredible that God has given us this tangible, edible sign to take us back? Take us back to the cross. And so in our corporate gathering, we not only want to read the word, pray the word, sing the word, preach the word. We want to see and taste the word. And that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's a visible, tangible sign. It's the gospel made visible by recalling the reality of Christ in a fresh and vivid way and looking to that past deliverance that's meant to shape us and transform us now. That's the first look. Here's the second look. We look back to the past, but we also look now in a new direction. We look within in self-examination. We look inward. Now, I'm actually going to spend some time next week unpacking that. All right, because that's where Paul's going, if you'll see there in verses 27 to 34. So I'm going to talk about that next week, but notice, because notice verse 28, let a person examine himself then, and so eat and the bread and drink the cup. We are to examine ourselves. In fact, notice that failure to do this, look at verse 27, leads to being Guilty and profaning the body and blood of the Lord. And that's why, look at verse 30, some are experiencing weakness, some are experiencing illness, and some have died. To not do this incurs the discipline and judgment of God. So this is very serious, this idea of self-examination. Now, what does that mean? Well, again, we're going to talk about that more next week, but it means we assess ourselves in light of the gospel. We examine our lives in light of the gospel. Is there unconfessed sin in my life? Unrepentant sin? Is there unrepentant sin in this church body? Are are, are there... there, Places where there needs to be reconciliation between members of this body, right? Sort of like what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. If you're offering your gift at the altar and they recognize your brother as something against you, first go be reconciled to your brother and then come off your gift. It's the same idea. There's a reconciliation that needs to happen in the body. Do I recognize my own sin and my need for grace? Do I recognize that I need to be continually turning away from sin in my life, putting it to death and trusting in Christ alone? Self-examination. Not, listen to me, and we'll talk about this next week, not to the point where you just say, well, I can't take the supper. This This is a meal for sinners. But you need to examine yourself. My wife cooking a meal at home, sometimes, you know, the kids will be tempted, dad will be tempted to try to taste the meal before it's time to sit down, you know, and she'll say, have you washed your hands before supper? You don't dare come to this meal, this table, with dirty hands. And beloved, in the same way, 
How dare we come to this table with dirty hands? Profaning what this meal symbolizes, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all of our sin. But we'll look at that in more depth and practical ways next week. But we look within in self-examination. Here's look number three. Look number three. We look back to the cross. We look within self-examination. Number three, we look around in fellowship. We look around. This, This horizontal not vertical, horizontal aspect of the Lord's Supper, I think is often the one we overlook the most. We miss the most. We neglect to look the most. This is a corporate, not an individual meal. So it's not, you know, it's just me and Jesus here having this spiritual experience. It's us. It's us. And so, in effect, one of the major purposes of this meal is to renew and remind ourselves of our commitment to one another in the body of Christ. In fact, notice, just go back to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Just look what Paul says here, chapter 10, verse 16. He says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread... We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. See what Paul's saying there? In in other words, the Lord's Supper is a way in which we express and remember and proclaim our oneness, our unity. We are Many, and yet we are one body. We have been united to Jesus Christ by faith, and we have been united to one another in his body, in membership in the local church. That's the problem in Corinth. The way in which they're taking the meal is distorting and undermining this oneness, this unity. There's something inherently corporate about this meal. That's why Paul says in this passage over and over, when you come together, when you come together. So in our partaking of the bread and the cup, we are visibly enacting the reality signified that we are truly one people. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ. Galatians 3. And so part of taking it rightly is to visibly be reminded that Jesus not only died for me, he died for that brother over there. He died for that sister over there. And we're one. We're one people. Look number four, finally. We look back, we look within, we look around. Number four, we look ahead. We look ahead in in anticipation. We look ahead in anticipation for Christ's return in glory. That's what we're doing. We're looking ahead to Jesus' return. Do you realize the Lord's Supper has an expiration date? Like, we're not going to take it forever. Luke chapter 22, again, Jesus said, verse 18, For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 26, Paul says, As often as you drink this cup and eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until when? He comes. So the Lord's Supper, then, is a prophetic event. It's a prophetic sign pointing forward and so every time we take it and enjoy it together we are reassuring ourselves and we're reassuring one another Jesus is coming again he is returning which means 
The Lord's Supper, in some sense, is a rehearsal dinner. (laughs) It's a rehearsal meal for another meal that's coming. Another meal we're going to share together. Listen to how Revelation 19 describes it in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of the mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted for her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are are the true words of God. That's what we're looking forward to. This is one of the reasons why the somberness of the Lord's Supper, I'll just be honest with you, sometimes really bothers me. Yes, it is a serious event, but it is an event for serious joy. As one author said, it's not meant to be a funeral service. It's meant to be a victory lap. A victory lap. And what he means by that is it is announcing the triumph of the Lamb over sin and death and Satan. And that day's coming. And that's what we're looking forward to. That's exactly how it should feel when we take this meal together. This is the day the church is waiting for. When we will feast in the kingdom of God forever with our Savior King. When Jesus will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God against his enemies. But listen, for those of us who are trusting in this Lamb, whose body was broken, his blood was shed for you, by faith trusting in him, the day of his return, this this coming day, The Lord's Supper reminds us that because Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath for you, you get to drink the cup of God's blessing at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we look back, we look within, we look around, and we look forward of Jesus' sure and final return. Let's pray. Lord, now as we come to your table, we recognize how significant, in part, this meal is. Help us to see with new eyes, fresh eyes today. Thank you for the Lamb's blood that was shed for us. We trust you were encouraged by the message you heard. For more information about our church, visit us online at www.2bcmtv.org or call us at 618-244-1706. And thank you for listening.